Welcome to Palkus's Next Gen, the show where we discuss issues related to young Portuguese Americans ranging from 18 years old to 35. Our goal is to ensure that our culture strives by focusing on the achievements of the latest generation, with the hope of discovering their secrets to success and continuing to inspire the Portuguese American community at large. Because in our community, Nosh got next and Nosh got now. Good evening to both of you. Uh, today we have Mariana Brazal, who is uh, somebody who works in history issues, is a Fulbright scholar and uh, graduated from the University of Virginia. And we're very excited to talk to her about all sorts of issues and being Portuguese American. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really looking forward to this. Yeah, so we'd like thanks to start you. just hearing about, um, you know, your background. What are you up to today? Uh, you know, what makes you stand out? Why did you want to be part of the podcast? Yeah, so we all start <laughs> where it all starts. I am uh, was born in Lisbon, Portugal, um, immigrated to the US uh, when I was nine months old. So quite just the baby um, came here with my immediate family and just kind of a driving factor in my life has always been art. Uh, my mom is an artist. My grandma's an artist, musician. So as we were kind of growing up here in the US, um, art became the way for me to understand who I was um, in this country, my family, you know, this several sort of identities. So I um, went off to University of Virginia and um, kind of followed that path, um, made my studies in international affairs, but kind of started missing that tie to art. So kind of the crux of my focus has been tying the two. So cultural diplomacy, you know, navigating these spaces my whole life, um, kind of found that as my research. So now I kind of brand myself as in the cultural work um, sector. I am an independent curator. I've worked on a series of exhibitions, um, but also work on a other variety of cultural activities and organizations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I have two exhibitions. Um, the first one was at the National Women's History Museum dedicated to telling the story of Latina suffragists and the suffrage movement in the US. The second one was actually at the University of Virginia's Fralin Museum of Art, and that was on Brazilian indigenous benches. Um, I got involved with um, these artists and this art form. Back during my time at um, UVA, I actually had read an incredible modernist piece of literature that really highlighted uh, the role of indigeneity in Brazil's identity. And I do also have Brazilian heritage, so it really kind of pushed me to challenge my understanding of that heritage. Um, and yeah, just decided to dedicate myself, look to art as usual, and see how I could, you know, expand um, representation of indigenous identity, knowledge, practice, and cultures through this art form. So kind of a roundabout way of <laughs> how I got into that um, curatorial sort of space. Very cool. Um, and, and the Brazilian uh, part of your identity, if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my grandfather is Brazilian. Um, so, you know, have that tie inextricably between the two countries, but, um, my parents also spent majority of their teenage years in Brazil. Um, my mom in Sao Paulo and my father in Rio. So I spend time there as well. Um, and so, you know, I was always kind of growing up with these three different cultures, the Portuguese, American, and Brazilian. So constantly trying to understand how they all relate, how they don't, and how that makes who I am. Amazing. And, uh, yeah, you had mentioned your family has been pretty involved in art. So what kind of art did uh, your family members do and how does that differ from the kind of things that you're interested in? Yeah, so we kind of had our hands full and kind of everything. Um, so my mother is a visual artist, um, abstract artist, focuses on a canvas, painting, drawing. My grandma worked with um, textiles. Um, she made these incredible tapestries. She was also a pianist. My uncle plays the clarinet. I grew up playing the piano, violin, my sister, the saxophone. Also have a little bit of performing arts. My sister was really into theater. She's now a graphic designer. So we kind of got um, just the whole range of um, arts. And then I guess I just, as this role of, you know, kind of intermediating between the cultures, I kind of saw my space as a lot of um, interlocutor roles, kind of that dialogue, um, and that's kind of where the curatorial part came in, trying to navigate those conversations. Um, so that's just kind of how it ended up through there. That sounds like destiny. I don't know. It feels <laughs> like if you're all around it, then it's it's got to be, you know, there's, there's some genetics happening, I think, too. <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, just understanding a little bit more about, like, curating, if you could just break that down, like, what does that look like on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, that kind of thing? Yeah, so I mean, you know, curating, it's like, uh, to the term it means like to care or to create an experience. And so, like I just mentioned, I'm all about that crux in dialogue. 
Um, my roles do have sort of a second hand where I am constantly promoting social justice, um, representations of people's histories and stories that are often left out. Um, it's, you know, close cause to my heart, kind of where I found my work on. So that starts with kind of the topics I choose to curate. Um, I My research and focus is on Brazilian indigenous art, just kind of thinking the indigeneity on a global scale, how we can rethink our own Western notion of aesthetics, how they have different origins. Um, so yeah, it starts in then choosing the topic. Um, the Brazilian indigenous bench collection is one that I work with constantly, but then also with the Latinx cause in the US um, and promoting those artists on a day to day, you know, it's things from, you know, organizing the whole exhibit, um, getting funding to then actually making the exhibit, choosing the pieces, getting the labels, writing the text. So it's a very dynamic and fun sort of work and, you know, causes you to constantly think about how you can really communicate between different groups of peoples and cultures. That's amazing. And how does one come across these, these kind of job opportunities if people are interested? Because I never really thought about like how to become a museum curator, but it's very cool. Yeah, so it's I'm sure there are different uh, ways to kind of go about it. Um, mine has been a little different. Um, so actually it was a pivot with my Fulbright. Um, I was there in February of 2020 and then the pandemic hit. Um, when that hit, it kind of pushed me to question where I want my research to go, the kinds of messages I want to bring in the spaces I want to take part in. So from there on out, I actually just reached out to my alma mater, um, the museum, and kind of fought to get that exhibition in. It took meetings. Um, it took me to secure my funding. Um, and then the other National Women's History Museums, that was an internship. So internships are really kind of the stepping stone for a lot of people. Um, they're short term. You either get to work on an exhibit or help support the research. Um, but one of the lessons I've learned is just a lot of talking to people. Um, if you see someone who's doing research you really like, or if there's a topic you're really interested on, go to that book, look at the footnotes, who's championing that research, find a way to reach out, um, mutual contacts, and just kind of, you know, hearing what people are doing. And then another caveat they'll put to that is that I did end up doing a Latin American studies um, major at the University of Virginia. And I think that really helped me. A lot of people come from art history backgrounds, but I really enjoyed the interdisciplinary nature of my major um, because I really got to grapple with all the intersection of different kinds of subjects and thoughts, which has been key to my understanding of art and diplomacy in this world. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit curious just because, um, and I don't know if your parents are like this or your family around you. I mean, they were artists, so I think they have a, a little bit different sensibility than maybe some people's backgrounds, you know, mine, uh, for example. Um, I remember like, you know, my graduation day for like, when I was graduating uh, undergrad and I double majored in journalism, women's studies. And uh, the journalism was not related to broadcast. And so if, you know, this is why Andrew does the bulk of the hard work here. Um, but anyway, so I was, you know, on my like graduation day and my, and my dad was kind of like, you know, women's studies degree, like, what do you do with that? You know? Um, and I think like a, a lot of, uh, and I think some of that is cultural, um, just, I mean, based on my experiences, but I'm curious for you, like, you know, majoring in like Latin American studies, I know that the interdisciplinary thing is so big and it's so beyond like sort of like one way pathway. Um, but I'm curious, like if you received any like sort of pushback or, you know, what was their sort of uh, response to you, you, uh, you majoring in uh, Latin American studies? Of course, yeah. So I was incredibly lucky. My parents are, you know, my champions, my supporters, and I think having them come from that art background, um, I think in my mom's case, she experienced that similar backlash when she went into the arts, um, when she was in Brazil and kind of telling that, um, kind of like, what are you going to do with that? What, what is there in the world? Um, and so I have to credit my parents, you know, for every single decision me and my sister have made. They've been our biggest supporters. And, you know, when I declare Latin American studies, they're kind of like, yep, yeah, that's that's exactly it. Like, go out, go research, go see how this world connects. Um, so I've been very lucky in that front. Um, for others who aren't as lucky, I know it can be kind of tough to explain, but I would just kind of say, you know, the world is so globalized nowadays. We overlap in so many fronts. And the only way to truly grasp that is to just dive in and accept the uncertainty or the unclear challenges, because it will just reframe your mind and have you become better thinker, worker in whatever area you go to. Love it. Um, and then, you know, just because you talked a little bit about sort of like um, providing a platform for maybe um, voices, faces that have been sort of, uh, I wouldn't say forgotten about, but um, sort of dot, <laughs> you look at the dominant narratives of like, say, you know, American history and that kind of thing. And so um, I'm curious for you, like, 
you know, my parents and stuff like, oh, like always kind of like um, lamented that, uh, you know, they teach the same thing in American history. We hear about the same things. And I kind of agree. I mean, to some extent, like the amount of times I've heard about Franz Ferdinand, for example, um, you know, and these kinds of people, they keep showing up. Um, and then, you know, when I got to college, I took a, a black women's studies uh, a history class. And, you know, that sort of like opened my mind to different ways to conceptualize to what is history. And I think a lot of that had to do with sort of black women's art, for example. So I'm curious for you, like, um, you know, for me taking that class, there's a bunch of things that I'm like, wow, like this is really what it is. Like we were taught the wrong things for so long. If there was something like that for you and your education um, and being so well-versed in it, if you could share it with like sort of uh, debunking myths and that kind of thing, uh, if you had anything you wanted to share, that would be like awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I would say college was truly pivotal for me as well. Um, you know, UVA has such a complicated history. Um, and I was there in a time where really kind of challenging that a lot of great student activism on grounds, but a lot of great faculty as well. So um, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but it was this piece of literature I read in a Brazilian literature class, um, which when I got to UVA actually I was like, oh, mom, I'm gonna meet a minor in Portuguese, by the way. And she was a little confused. She was a little like, oh, don't you want to do a different language? You know, you're, you know it, we spoke at home. I was like, no, like this is an important part of my identity. I really want to, you know, dive deeper into it, you know, get more critical, um, basically. So I was in this Brazilian literature class and it was called the um, uh, Anthropophagist Manifesto um, by Oswaldo Andrade. It was during the modernist phase of Brazil where they're really kind of questioning um, just forms of expression, kind of questioning histories. And as I mentioned, at the forefront of it was just a total embrace of indigeneity, of it being just, you know, the center of Brazilian heritage. And kind of, as I mentioned, I was like, I've grown up with this heritage um, on the weekends, you know, cooking the food, listening to museum, the cuisines, but I don't really know too much about, you know, the indigenous peoples, the roots of this country before the nation state even existed. And so, it, you know, I just was struck by that. I kind of looked at my professors, was like, how can I learn more? Where are more texts? Where are more research? Where are contemporary people talking about it? Um, and they really helped guide me into that space. So really took, you know, another form, literature in this instance, to just kind of, you know, help me to my feet and kind of challenge that. Um, and from there, of course, I've been constantly seeking out. I've done research on the Vargas administration and his um, development policies for indigenous peoples, just kind of constantly every lens. Now I look, I try to be critical um, at who's writing that history, who's getting to tell it. Yeah, that's fascinating. And that it really seems like you've plunged into kind of those intersections and the interdimensional uh, aspects of these issues. So what is, for example, like a, or like a living example of this at your job, um, at work, curation, you know, <clears throat> sorry, what are some of the issues that arise uh, frequently with these exhibits that you've had to tackle or potentially, you know, narratives that you've had to uh, kind of, I guess, present more a balanced perspective on? Yeah, I know it's as much as I'm into art, um, I think art also upholds this very institutional place um, with a lot of Eurocentric um, views and a lot of just um, the certain, same sort of narrative. So there are times where I'm like, hey, I, you know, I see art as such a tool, but it is operating in a space that has uplifted these institutions um, so long. So um, for me, you know, I'm a big proponent in uh, representation, empowerment, but not in a way that it's focused on the person that it's supposed to, you know, mean to not, you know, coming from me and my role. So kind of uplifting voices and spaces. So for example, in the latest exhibit, exhibit with the indigenous benches, a lot of care was going to it being not our voice necessarily, but the artists in there, um, you know, showing them how it's looking, how it's the, the route is looking, how the labels are, the text. So it's a lot about uplifting those um, perspectives and spaces. But then more broadly in the space, it's about championing these kinds of artists um, in museums and institutions. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of kind of cautious liberation from as little from labels, you know, making sure, oh, we have this label. But so, you know, this is how we colloquially refer to it. It's not, you know, the deemed title. What does that mean? So from the deliberate to the larger, you know, narratives of why is this exhibition important? And how can we kind of gear then the visitors so they understand the importance of it? Right. I think that's so important. Like, I don't know about you, Kayla, but I, you know, I grew up, I didn't really think much about art and I took an art history class in high school and it was just like something had changed. Uh, you know, let's say my eyes opened. So now when I see it, I like, go to a museum, like these are not always things that you consciously notice, but I think that 
when you leave a museum, it probably does impact the narratives that you leave with and you know, what you learned and how you process it. So what have been some of the challenges uh, that you faced in, in that job? Challenges that I face in the job. Um, I would say it's the, along the same line of wanting to have the lens and the focus um, be one that is equitable, that is representative, that is properly um, including these voices and giving these voices the opportunity to speak up. Um, so it all kind of relates around that and just kind of trying to always question yourself too, you know, um, as you go along the way, make sure that, you know, your intentions are good, but that there will be mistakes to be made um, and just kind of being honest with yourself and constantly learning as you navigate through these spaces. You know, I, I kind of love that, um, you know, you talked about sort of amplifying voices. I mean, in some ways, that's, that's really what we're trying to do with this, <laughs> this podcast, right? Uh, sort of meta in that way. But um you know, and I, you know, in the, what you had sort of shared earlier, you're talking about amplifying specifically like Latinx voices. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was recently an article I came across, you know, all these things pop up in my, you know, inbox about um, and some study that was published in it was Politico. And they talked about, are you, <laughs> you know, where I'm going with this already. Uh, but anyway, you know, it sort of said like, like a large portion, I think it was something like 40%. Uh, don't quote me on that, people. Um, just sort of estimating uh, of of Hispanic voters um, find the term um, Latinx like offensive, and so I was like kind of curious because this is I work in fair housing, so it's housing discrimination cases, and so obviously you know how we uh, talk about people's identities is kind of important to me. So I you know I read a little bit on some different articles and stuff that were uh, you know, being shared related to the topic. Of course, you see these sort of politicians saying you know harping on and oh, that's why we have, don't have latinx anywhere in our literature and this and that you know mm-hmm. you know how politicians can be sort of the uh opinions as the winds blow um but you know then i saw like another piece because you know for me I, it took me a minute to to understand what latinx was because it wasn't something that was talked about you know in my sphere um but uh you know once i did i, did, I was like oh okay i guess that makes sense <laughs> right but I had read like this recent uh, piece that, that came out like from this news uh, recently that was saying like, you know, that it was an anglicization. I'm probably saying that wrong. Excuse me. Uh, basically, it's sort of like uh, Anglos taking uh, the term and and trying to make it their own versus like and sort of like defies like basic rules of Spanish language and that kind of thing. And so this is why um, people would find it um you know, uh, offensive. And then, you know, there's other terms that, that this person had proposed. Um, Latin was like one that I guess had originally, and then of course, just Latin and Latin American. And I'm, cu- I'm curious for you, how you, you know, how that sort of lands, obviously when we ask people these things, it's not, I'm not asking, I'm not like the politician that says they speak on behalf of everyone. And I don't expect other people to speak on behalf of everyone. <laughs> um, but I'm curious for you, like, because when I read that, I was like, oh, well, I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense for someone who's like, you know, sort of a native speaker or, uh, you know, whether it's um, Spanish or Portuguese and that kind of thing. And how does that um, like land? And, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, if <laughs> I'm going to be honest, like a lot of people who appear white, um, you know, whether they identify as white or not, but um, there can be a lot of like sort of uh, cultural identity politics that go with this. And so, you don't want to be saying necessarily it's something that uh, people find offensive if you're trying to be inclusive, right? So I was just curious for you if you had any thoughts on that, just because the re- very recent uh, article that came across my my emails this week, I guess. Yeah, yeah. so that's um, definitely, you know, kind of a debate um, and dialogue that's been going on. Um, so when it emerged, I, you know, I think it, it came as two sort of points. One, to be more inclusive, um, you know, with the X or removing any sort of feminine, masculine sort of associations with um, Spanish, but, you know, Roman language in general. And two, it also came to reflect um, a new identity that I, that is, you know, you know, I don't want to categorize it as one because it's not, but a reality of those of Latin American um, descent um, that are living in the U.S. and whose lives have mostly been in the U.S. So kind of those two fronts, um, like I said, I don't, you know, I don't know the answer, I don't represent it. to everyone, but I kind of, you know, those were the two ways that it came in. And um, I know that there's, you know, a lot of debate, but I think they can be used, you know, interchangeably. Um, 
I, you know, I get, I get kind of sad that it does create so much division. Um, I think that Latinidad is a really tough um, question. You know, I have a multitude of different identities, um, whether that is, you know, from different countries, but then different experiences that cross act when they're here in the US, you know, as Portuguese American and Brazilian American, there's so many different identities and how to represent that. So in dealing with those, you know, try to use them interchangeably and just kind of try to focus um, not on the things that will divide, but the things that can kind of bring together and accepting those because um, it is a tough question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think in general, like, you know, these, these differences, sometimes, you know, we the line on sort of sameness and similar backgrounds and this kind of thing. I think also like embracing difference. I mean, mm -hmm. I think your story already, I mean, to, you know, sort of, you know, that's a, that's a crazy thing, but obviously like embracing all these parts, different parts of your identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like it's a it's a large por portion of portion of what it is that you do. You know, it's not just a box that you tick. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know if you feel that way, but yeah, no, no, definitely. I think we all have um, certain experiences um, that just kind of shape and inform who we are today. So it's it's easier to kind of focus on that and you know all the complexity to it. Yeah, this this actually reminds me of a conversation we had in Next Gen very early on, but it stands out to me because it was one of the more impactful ones. Uh, there's this debate that a lot of our listeners will, listeners will know about, you know, are Portuguese Hispanic? Are they Latino? Like, what, what do we count as? Um, I know personally, when I was applying to law schools, like, some of the law schools literally said, check this box, including if you are from Spain. And I'm like, I know I hate to be confused for, like, Spanish person. But at the same time, you feel like, well, Portugal's, like, right next to it. It's, like, literally surrounded by Spain. I mean, how come I can't check that box probably, you know, so what do you make of that? And I know, of course, bringing your Brazilian identity to the table as well, that, that creates more complexity and diversity. Uh, but what do you think about the whole discussion within our community and maybe how we can branch out and form connections with other communities? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. <laughs> um, it's definitely not an easy one to navigate. Because um, I do think, you know, Portugal is its own set of you know, heritage and experiences. Um, and then you do have your, you know, tie with the Brazilian. Um, I think in me trying to navigate that, I just, um, I might totally be dodging your question here, but I try to like not even focus on that box, right? Of like trying to categorize ourselves on like nationality. Um, I know we are inextricably tied, but just kind of trying to focus more on those experiences. Um, and especially now as um, us, I mean, growing up in the US, but totally dodging your question there but i would say no that no, no. no no you're just getting you're getting into the end that was the conclusion of our i think our our long discussion with the many voices that were were being heard i think you know um and just hearing different stories i know i don't know andrew if you want to share um the one that you shared in the next gen but uh just incredible to hear i mean to give you a little bit of background though uh because i don't think these podcast episodes have aired yet um i'm like from the northeast you know Rhode Island, Massachusetts area uh so i grew up like in sort of a heavily concentrated area of people of portuguese descent um and a lot of his orient andrew grew up in like kansas yeah and so you know <laughs> totally different experiences and so how you know sort of that um like for example portuguese american uh, identity might manifest itself different ways and i think um i think that you just skip to the conclusion that you know uh, ultimately like you know the word doesn't mean all that much. Um, <laughs> the experience is really what, uh, you know, just it's, it's sad that it kind of gets boiled down to this, you know, checkbox. But, and, and as you yeah. said, when you kind of asked like um, how to kind of bridge that, I mean, that's what the podcast is, right? Or this space is, right? right? It's all when we get together and get to share that. Um, Cause yeah, it's, you know, how we even like areas we grew up here in the US, um, I moved around quite a bit. We were first up in New Hampshire. Um, had much more of a Portuguese community there than we were in Texas and then now Virginia. So you kind of see how those experiences kind of shape from where you move. So yeah, it's a new yeah. space to discuss that. What I found was like growing up because we were pretty much the only Portuguese people around Wichita. Um, I actually found a lot of like overlap and, and like cultural experiential overlap uh, with a lot of my friends, like, especially from Mexico, El Salvador, uh, Central America. It was interesting because I never would have expected that, but you know, playing soccer, uh, listening to music, you know, we all have music with a lot of accordion sounds. Uh, there are a lot of like little similarities you notice that I think help bring me together with my friends uh, that you just wouldn't think about necessarily if you were maybe living in like a Fall River or a Newark, well, maybe Newark, but, you know, I think each part of the country has 
new opportunities to reach out to other communities. And that's very valuable. I'm curious for you if you've seen any sort of differences in the in the art, like, is it, you know, Andrew talked about sort of the, or similarities or differences with the, within the art world, just because, you know, he talked about the accordion. So, <laughs> but I'm um, curious for you, like in, in your studies. Yeah. So I think um, I'm really trying to push against um, the, you know, the, just the grouping um, with like aesthetics, um, especially with regards okay. to sort of na nationality um, and branding it um, through nations. Um, so I think, you know, it, you know, I, I, a lot of my crux in my thesis and my research is a lot of um, things on the interconnectedness on a global scale. So I'm trying to kind of sure push back against it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so push beyond those. Um, so in terms of our world, yeah, you know, you find connections um, from, you know, techniques. Yeah. But um, I, I, I keep going back to those experiences, right. And the, the current, you know, thematic waves that are going on in our society. And how did you, uh, this is another question I kind of had about that. Uh, how did you end up like settling on on benches? Like, how do you how did you find that? How did you end up with that as your focus? Because that's so incredibly fascinating. Yeah, so that actually was a collection that I got in contact with um, via my uncle in Brazil. Um, and so, um, as a kind of wooden art form, it is one of the more um, traditional art forms for these peoples. Um, they're used um, in their communities on a day to day basis, but also in a lot of their um, rituals. So kind of landed on that. And I just saw it as like such a potent communicative vehicle for that reason. You know, it is has such a a um, multifaceted um, being to it. You know, it's you know, it's a uh, utilitarian, but also um, symbolic. And so just kind of laid in that crux of those dualities um, to, to you to focus on. Yeah, and the, the other thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about just because um you know, and what you had shared with us uh, before the podcast, you talked a little bit about getting a, a Fulbright, Fulbright grant. And so I was just curious if you could break that down for people, um, sort of what it is, how would you apply for it? Um, you know, how do you find, how do you find it? Um, and, you know, how, how is it sort of employed and used? Yeah, so um, Fulbright. So I think just another point to even make, right, was kind of navigating, um, and I'm going to kind of zoom out and zoom back in for a second here, was kind of navigating um, college and like these fellowship processes also as a first generation um, immigrant, you know, um, obviously my parents helped a ton with college, but you know, kind of everyone was learning in it together. And so when I got to college, um, was really passionate about my research and just kind of wanted a chance to focus on it. Um, so once I got to UVA, I got involved with our scholarships um, and fellowships, um, actually just our fellowships office. Um, and through there, um, usually every school has one and they can kind of do um, workshops or kind of help you navigate all these steps. So I came across the Fulbright and there's two types, basically there's an English teaching assistant one where you get to go and to a different host country and you get to teach English at one of the universities. And then there's a research one where you are you propose your research of topic, you find an affiliation at a university, and then you get the grant to complete that research. Um, just having this research so close to my heart, I knew that research was always kind of the way to go. So I ended up choosing um, Brazil um, for the benches and finding faculty in Sao Paulo at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, to navigate that, it was a lot of reaching out, cold emails, like I said, reading, finding who's working on the topic, um, and trying to find someone that could kind of support your project. Um, through that then, um, Fulbright actually is one of the scholarships where you have to go through university. So you have to go through a whole endorsement process. Um, it requires an interview and a letter of sponsorship from university in addition to recommendation letters. Um, and you usually want to start it like about six months, year in advance. Um, so that's kind of the Fulbright. Um, and usually the grants last up to nine months. Um, they pay for your housing, um, the flights, any extra. And the crux of that scholarship truly is cultural exchange um, and kind of getting people out there so that they can see other people's other cultures and then bring back that knowledge um, to the US. So that's the Fulbright. <laughs> So were there any um, challenges in the process that um, you would, you know, anyone considering this, applying for a fellowship in general? Uh, what are some things to keep in mind, of course, beyond the timeline, which is probably an immensely helpful thing to know about? Reach out. I mean, I that has been huge for me, I think, in every part of, you know, these past couple of years. But reach out. If you see someone, 
you know, who got one or got a different one that you know is doing something you 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 are interested in just send a message try to get a call in because people are so willing to talk about it so i think i was very um trying to navigate that at first so i had lots of conversations with people about um how to go about that um other thing is just have you know your team in your corner the people are going to review your um your personal statements the people are going to write your recommendations um so those were kind of the challenges was you know, kind of understanding how to go about this, but then everything you needed, like who is gonna be the one to review my statements, who's gonna write my recommendation letter. Um, but yeah, it's just all about reaching out and talking to people. You know, I, I love that you like push back on sort of, uh, you know, what are the differences and, you know, based on nationality in terms of the, the art. And and we talked a little bit about sort of writing beyond the, the dominant narrative in terms of constructing a certain history or reconstructing it, reimagining it, this kind of thing. Um, so sort of debunking myths, um, you know, to someone who says like, no, research is kind of boring, you would say. <laughs> I would say I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, I think, and I think that's also just become an innate part of who I am as I was kind of navigating um, this country too, right? And trying to figure things out. I just became a, just a, someone who needed to kind of figure out why, uh, like, okay, we do this. Okay, but why let me like kind of understand that. So I think I actually do tie that sense of research um, to kind of growing up here and trying to really understand things. So your timeline, you mentioned that you actually, did you get to actually go to Brazil before the pandemic happened or? A month and a half I was there. I arrived okay, wow. in February, March 21st, I was on my way back. <laughs> Were there any experiences that you got to have within that very short time frame that you really enjoyed and would advise people if they go to Brazil? Oh, I got Carnaval. So it was um, oh, amazing. an incredible, incredible time. I, I hold that month and a half so close to my heart. Um, it was a tough one, tough one to process and come back and understand. <laughs> and how did you do your research? Uh, how did that go doing it kind of virtually, I guess? I know everyone's lives was, were thrown into flux, but I imagine something like that where you're connected with somebody on the ground, it would be very difficult. So how did you manage that? Yeah, so actually, um, when we were sent back, our Fulbright was done um, just due to um, just, you know, see, uh, concerns with the pandemic. So they actually um, just ended up ending the, the Fulbright. But I was kind of in that moment where I'm going to come back to the U.S., but um, the people that I work so closely with are the ones that are going to be getting left behind, are the ones who are going to need the most help. So even though it ended in its official capacity, I stayed working on um, what I could till about August of that year. Um, ended up applying to some grants through the State Department. Um, they have these citizen diplomacy rapid response um, action funds. So I ended up getting some money to then help support artists during the pandemic. Just thinking through how the shutdown of the economy, quarantine will impact the market, circulation of the economy, um, as they're staying in their community. So got some funds to basically get um, all the materials to make the benches um, to the community safely. And then also helping you know, digital citizenship, how we can kind of start to circulate them and sell them online, getting them in contact with potential vendors and then any logistics of shipping in a pandemic world um, with concerns over COVID. So just kind of worked um, from afar there, also helped spearhead some fundraising campaigns um, with the collection of benches, Colesson Bay in Brazil, um, to get you know some money, cash in their hands to buy medical supplies, food, clothing, um, whatever was needed. So try to stick, um, stick, stick through it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, sort of the fundraising and, and uh... And so what was the process in that? And do you have any tips for people? I know there's a lot of people that, are, mm -hmm. that sort of get into that, whether it's, you know, sales or something totally different. Um, yeah, anything yeah. you've learned from that? So yeah, um, so just kind of one of the skills I developed at university was just kind of finding um, sources of fundraising um, and getting those applications through. So a lot of practice in kind of grant writing, just um, also asking other people who've done it before, seeing whatever workshops there are. I think that's kind of one thing pandemic, right? There's a lot of resources online now, um, tutorials, on how to do this that you can easily do from your home. So not being scared also to apply, you know, you see a source of funding um, and sometimes you are just a team of one, sometimes you have a team of many, but just kind of not being scared to apply. You have a project, you're dedicated about it. Find that source of funding, write that proposal, talk to who you can, but just submit as well. And you, you never know kind of what will pan out. Yeah, I, I, I'm just to go, to go back to one of the things you had said, like, and I might be conflating the two, so if I am, 
you know, tell me I'm wrong. That's won't be the first time. Um, I know you talked a little bit about um, sort of like being interested like in indigenous sort of art. And so sort of we're talking like sort of the origins, right? And then you talked a lot about um, how contemporary artists are looking at it. I'm curious for you if there was like a tension between those two things and well, like why, why those, why those two, I, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, so there actually is a um, growing movement um, out of Brazil um, termed contemporary indigenous artists. Um, the champion of that has been Jair Isbel. Um, when I look to contemporary, which, um, you know, I can definitely pick a problem with even the term contemporary just kind of means, um, you know, current artists um, producing artwork now. Um, but so I guess I, you know, I want to just bypass that term because, you know, indigenous artists have, you know, been artists the whole time and are artists now. Um, but just trying to think of, you know, in these spaces that we do have, like how they kind of almost have to brand themselves as contemporary to kind of be included. Um, so that is, you know, kind of a question of the term, but there's a really big movement um, in coming out of Brazil, some incredible artists, Dayara Tucano, um, they were just featured at Sao Paulo's Biennale. Um, so they're really doing um, incredible work on these stages. Um, and so just kind of working along those lines, seeing what these artists are doing, how they're inserting themselves in the spaces. Um, but then what are the reactions kind of from, you know, the, the Western art world um, to, to that sort of reaction? Where, where can we check out, like, if we're interested in, you know, actually seeing some of the great things you're talking about, like, where, where can yeah. we check it out? Yeah, so I would Instagram. Um, these artists are incredibly active on Instagram. It's actually a huge source. I follow kind of all these artists on there. So just go ahead and look up their names. Um, they're all, you know, very active on their pages, um, constantly working together. There's a curator called Nain Tadana who's doing some great work as well. Um, a lot of people just being just incredibly fierce um, and doing this work on a quite large platforms, but definitely check out um, their Instagrams. Have you connected with anybody like via the you know Instagram platform, whatever? Oh yes. Uh, in, in, for your, as part of your work, yeah. Have you? Uh, completely. Oh yeah. Um, and Instagram's been my kind of great connector. Um, Brazil, it's you know a huge platform. But even when I was at UVA, we had um, funding to do some artist talks. Um, and so you know, as an exhibition, we had some indigenous artists um, come to classes at U the University of Virginia. Actually, we had Daniel Munduruku, who's an incredible. Um, writer, um, very incredible indigenous literature. He came to one of our classes. We had Joanna Tikuna, um, she's a singer. She came to another class. And we had a panel with Nain Tirana and Mewari Mehinaku who um, came to kind of talk about indigenous art in the art sphere. So um, some of those were made through Instagram. Some uh, were just, you know, contacts I kind of already had, but yeah, you can definitely, um, definitely reach out through Instagram. And how have you found, uh, you know, some of the artists you mentioned, artists stateside that you you kind of promote as well, um, you know, what kind of art are they doing? Uh, who are some notable ones? What's been your experience with that? Yeah, so um, stateside, you mean like U.S.? In the U.S., like yeah, you mentioned so. Latin art, Latino yes, artists in the see. U.S. So um, I'm going to do a better one. And so if people are really interested in that topic and kind of the on the crux of Latinx art, there's an incredible book. Um, it's called, actually I have my bedside table right here, Latinx Art by Arlene Davila. And she kind of outlines this whole um you know, ongoing issue of Latinx art being invisible um, in the US. And there's some incredible highlights, shout outs to people doing incredible work and kind of really makes you um, question what's what's going on in the art world. You know, I think a lot of art has, is sort of asking those questions and maybe mm -hmm. it's never finding, you know, the the answer, but it's, it's in the struggle, right? Um, right? You know, and that sort of goes across different platforms of art. Um, what question do you think, um, keeps coming up in, in your work, even if it's across different projects necessarily? For me personally, for the art. Yeah, for you personally, time, sure. For me personally, um, for me personally, it's kind of recognizing um, the spaces I operate in, recognizing the privileges I hold um, that have kind of gotten me to certain points um, and making sure I'm always um, being, doing justice, being equitable, um, being, being fair. Um, so, you know, everything I do, I really do kind of question deeply um, the spaces I operate in, how I can, you know, uplift um, people as well, but also what, who uplifted me to get to that space or what other um, sort of systems uplifted me to get into that space. So it's a lot of um, kind of questioning as I go. <laughs> how is I'm your, uh, talk, yeah, talking about yeah. people who have uplifted you, um, you know, how have you, 
especially I think about um, asking about, you know, how is your relationship with your grandma, for example, being an artist and all. I know with my grandparents, they've just been like an indispensable part of my life. So has she inspired you in any ways? Has she given you kind of the tools that you need to enter this space? Um, if you have a relationship with her, of course. Yeah, I do. Unfortunately, she has passed um, when I was in high school. But, um, you know, even when my exhibit um, went live, it was a virtual one at the University of Virginia. It was kind of like an ancestral experience. I kept saying that to my mom because I was like, my mom kind of said that too. You know, it's like you do this, but it feels like part of me. And it just was that tie, right? And I could just feel it, yeah. you know, starting with my grandma you know, kind of forging the path and my mom and me, um, it's a very kind of ancestral thing. So um, even though while she isn't here, you know, it's still um, very connected and, you know, laid the foundation for things that truly inform my work every day. Yeah, I often feel that sometimes it, sometimes it might feel like pressure from the past. Sometimes it might feel like, you know, inspiration from the past. I don't know if you're the same way, Kayla. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> I think sometimes, you know, uh even for people that don't necessarily aren't going the same fields as their uh you know sort of their grandparents or their parents mm -hmm. uh there is like this sort of like um i don't want to say torch because it's not really quite right but um it's sort Interco of responsibility yeah. to yeah In interconnectedness to, you know, yeah. yeah right exactly exactly <laughs> and uh i think you know some of it's uh, we've talked a lot in this podcast about sort of the mental pressures that that could you know put on people you know particularly of our generation and that kind of thing and i do think like uh it can be a definite tightrope um that we sort of walk um but i think like as you know much like we talked about art i think it's in the the struggle that we find meaning you know completely i don't know if you, more fat. yeah no no <laughs> right right yeah yeah no, i don't know they're, they're, there definitely is um, a lot of those pressures, you know, as we're navigating um, all of this, you know, from every every kind of generation that came before, and it can be a lot of pressure at times. Um, it can be a lot of motivation at times. So, you know, also finding ways to balance that to kind of escape that um, is, is so key. And how do you building on? Yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah. balance is key. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, building on that, like looking towards the future, do you have any ambitions to like run a museum someday? Um, go back to school, teach at all, or, you know, what's, yeah. what are in the cards? Um, long term, I, I want to get my PhD um, in the research that I do, um, rethinking, you know, a lot of these intersections on a global scale within the art world. And then, yeah, I would, I'd love to keep, you know, championing this, this sort of idea, whether that is, you know, at the head of a museum, head of other institutions, just kind of each step kind of, um, you know, navigating different spaces on how we can kind of advance um, social justice through the arts. Thank you for joining us on this week's Palkus's Next Gen. This week's podcast was brought to you by Palkus, the Portuguese American Leadership Council of the United States. You can find this episode on iTunes, palkus.org, Amazon Music, and any place where podcasts can be found. The Next Gen logo is designed by Silveira Designs. This podcast is produced by Aaron Homem, with post production by Scott Donnell of Run and Drum Media and original theme music by Pedro H. Da Silva. 